most of our attitudes or opinions are going to be easily accessible and something that we can explicitly state. But we also have something that are called implicit biases. So things that we might not be able to explicitly state. Things that we might not even know that we have biases towards. So we might not even be aware that we have this kind of bias. Um, and so there are specific psychological tests that have been designed to try and quantify different feelings and opinions, especially about sensitive issues that might be very difficult to get self-reports on, um, especially accurate self-reports. Because there are certain topics that people don't like to talk about, or maybe even that they don't believe that they might have bias towards different groups or religions or ethnicities or any number of these sensitive topics. Um, and so sometimes when you're trying to study this as a researcher, you're going to have to use something like an implicit association test to try and get at these uh, sort of implicit biases in different ways. Our next concept is going to be the theory of cognitive dissonance. And this was de developed by Leon, Leon Festinger. Um, and so cognitive dis dissonance is when attitudes and behaviors end up being inconsistent. So maybe you have an attitude where you think that you like something, but then maybe you behave in a way that's like you don't like something. So if your behavior and your attitudes are inconsistent, it ends up creating dissonance, specifically cognitive dissonance. And it's a state of unease that you start feeling. And so you'll be motivated to try and reduce this feeling of unease that's been driven by the fact that your attitudes and your behaviors don't match. And so how can we reduce this cognitive dissonance? Well, we might change our attitude or our behavior. So if we're always talking about how much we love orange juice, it's our favorite drink, um, but then you realize that you haven't had orange juice to drink in years. Instead, you've started drinking grape juice. So you might have to change either your attitude, maybe you change it so that you tell people that grape juice is now your favorite drink. Or you change your behavior and say, oh yeah, I really do like orange juice, I'm going to drink it more often. So you can change either of those, and that's probably the healthier approach to take. But there are also ways that people can distort their attitude or behavior. So they can deny that their attitude is one way or another, or they might deny that their behavior is inconsistent with their attitude. And so with the example of orange juice versus grape juice, that might be kind of difficult. So maybe somebody could say, oh, I've never said that I liked uh, orange juice. I've always drank grape juice. That's always been my favorite. Or they might say that um, I don't drink orange juice because I had so much of it. It's still my favorite. I still love it. I would have it all the time, but I just haven't lately for other reasons. So some kind of distortion of what's actually happening. And of course, if we were looking at bigger issues like liking a person or a group or a place or any of these things, it gets a lot more complicated. Um, but that's just sort of a simple, silly example for me. And then this here is just a flow chart, a uh, flow chart showing exactly what we were just talking about. So when we have dissonance arousing situational events where we realize that our attitude and our behavior don't match, we're going to have sort of that uh, event occur that makes us come to that realization. We're going to perceive those inconsistencies, and then we're going to engage in some kind of dissonance reducing strategy. So where we change either our attitude or behavior or distort our attitude behavior. And when we do this, change or distort one of those two, we can reduce that feeling of dissonance. And luckily, I just realized I did put in this part of the slide where we have a better example than my orange juice versus grape juice example. So let's look at smoking. So we can look at changing either our attitude or behavior in terms of smoking or distorting our attitude or behavior in terms of smoking. So if you're smoking, but you also know that it's not good for you, then maybe you're going to have an attitude change. So I know a ton of people who smoke and they don't have cancer. So instead of saying that you're going to change your behavior of smoking, you're going to say, well, I know lots of people who smoke. They smoke a lot more than me and they're fine. 
So what I'm going to do is keep smoking. It's not like I'm doing something worse. So you adjust your attitude. You don't think of smoking as that bad. So your behavior of smoking isn't necessarily a bad thing because it's consistent with your new attitude of it's not that bad. Or we can have a behavior change where you stop smoking because you don't want to have all of the negative effects that can come from uh, smoking. For attitude distortion, we can say that the link between smoking and cancer is only for heavy smokers. And I'm not a heavy smoker, so um, even so, we've, most people who get cancer don't even smoke. It's like the chemicals and preservatives in foods. It's something else. You've distorted that perspective. So you're still saying that smoking isn't bad and I'm going to continue smoking. Or sorry, you're saying that smoking is bad, but only for people who smoke heavily. So for you, it doesn't count. There's other things to worry about. It's not an issue. No problem. For behavior distortion, you might say that I, I don't really smoke that much. I only smoke a couple of cigarettes a day. It's not that bad. I'm more of a social smoker. My behavior isn't that bad. So you change your perception of your own behavior. So you distort that interpretation of your behavior. Um, so this is a much better example than mine. So this should hopefully help you clarify between changing and distorting attitudes and behaviors. Next, we're going to start talking about um, some things that are a little bit more serious. We're going to start talking about stereotypes, and then we'll eventually get into prejudice and even discrimination. So starting off with stereotypes. Stereotypes are attitudes and opinions about people that are based on their group affiliation. And though some people can share similar traits, the problem that comes from stereotyping is that we assume that all members of a group end up sharing identical traits. So there might be some kernel of truth behind some stereotypes, at least in the beginning, but the application of that is erroneous. So, for example, we can have lots and lots of biological and psychological studies that show that as we get older, we tend to see a decline in our cognitive processes, our reaction times, and our reflexes. So, as we get older, some of our abilities will sort of reduce. Um, that is a statement of fact based on different physiological measures correlated with age of a whole bunch of different individuals. But if you end up saying that all adults are bad drivers because they have all of these reductions in their abilities, that's a generalization to an entire group. So we have some evidence that we started with, but it's been expanded and applied in a way that isn't necessarily accurate and can potentially become harmful, as we'll see as we move along in this topic. It is interesting to note that all not all stereotypes are negative, but they typically are not beneficial. So whether they're positive or negative in framing, they can still cause problems because it's almost like a shortcut in thinking. You're applying a statement to a large group of people, whether it fits or not. And so any conclusions that you make based on that erroneous application of knowledge is then going to be flawed. Another thing to note is that the perception of differences in groups ends up varying based on the group affiliation of the perceiver. So what this means is that we tend to assume that our own group, the in-group, is heterogeneous, basically meaning that there's lots of variation, there's lots of differences within the group that I am part of. And that might be because you feel like you don't fit any particular stereotype of your group, or whatever reason. So you view yourself and the rest of your group as having lots and lots of differences, but you tend to view other groups, the out group, so the people who are not you, as homogenous, where they all fit for a particular trait, whether it's a physical characteristic, a shared attitude, a religious affiliation, or common ideologies. So whatever you're using to group people into these different groups, you assume that your group has lots of variety in it and other groups are homogenous and identical. And again, as we said, that's very problematic because it's leading to sort of false information or false application of information. 
And this is uh, clearly illustrated in a concept called stereotype threat. And this is when a person or a group experiences a significant amount of fear of confirming negative expectations about their own social group. And then that fear of performing in a particular way to confirm those expectations ends up adversely affecting their performance. So this is a really interesting concept that's actually been shown a couple of different ways. So what I'm going to do is actually hop between this slide and the graph on the next slide. And we're going to talk about a situation where we have the stereotype of boys are better at math than girls. So maybe you've seen some statistical studies or maybe you've seen some um, papers that have reported that um, say males tend to do better at logical and hard reasoning tasks while females tend to do better at um, spatial tasks and relationship tasks um, where they get to make associations. And so maybe from that data you have concluded that boys are better at math than girls. Um, and so if we use that as a stereotype and we set up an experiment where we have boys and girls, so I think in this instance we were looking at um, children who are going to be taking a standardized mathematics test, and some of them were put in the high stereotype threat group or high ST group, and some were in the low ST group. Um, and so what that means is that some of them weren't told anything about boys or girls being better at math, whereas the ones in the high stereotype threat group were told that boys are better than math, girls aren't good at math. And so what we end up seeing is that when there isn't any kind of reference made to how they should perform, when we don't set up that stereotype and we don't induce that anxiety about performing poorly, we see that boys and girls perform almost the same on that test. However, when that stereotype threat is established, the performance in the girls in this experiment dropped significantly. And so we see that they perform a lot more poorly because of this idea of stereotype of, uh, threat. So this adversely affects their performance. And it might be due to something like a self-fulfilling prophecy where you're told that you're bad at this thing, so you think you shouldn't try hard because you're already bad at it, but then because you haven't tried hard, you do poorly. Um, and so this is shown a bunch of different times in a bunch of different ways with mathematical ability across gender. Um, there's also lots and lots of different studies that have looked at this if this is something you're interested in. But this stereotype threat seems to be a very real issue with performance and people shaping their behavior or changing their behavior, um, sometimes ending up sort of enhancing a stereotype without meaning to. So next we have uh, the concept of prejudice. So if stereotyping is a means of categorizing people, um, this, as I've said, is sort of a, um, a shortcut, an ac inaccurate shortcut that might be helpful if it allows for faster processing. You assume that all people from that particular school are friendly because everyone you've met from that particular school is friendly. So now whenever you see someone wearing that school's colors, you assume they're friendly. So you don't have to think about it too, too much. So some stereotypes might be negative. Others might pertain to desirable traits. So one of those um, that associates something with a desirable trait is um, the assumption that beauty is associated with positive uh, attributes. So people who are beautiful are usually marked as or uh, assumed to be kinder, more helpful, um, all of those things that we might think of as good. And so while stereotyping might be positive or negative and doesn't necessarily have an inherent sort of um, trying to cause harm, prejudice is inherently negative. So as I said, we're kind of moving down the list of severity here. And so prejudice is going to be learned and specifically negative attitudes or opinions that a person has towards certain groups. And so again, these groups can be formed based on any kind of characteristic or trait that uh, someone deems worthy of grouping people by. And so while stereotypes are going to be overgeneralizations, not necessarily negative, prejudice is going to be learned and always negative. 
Um, and so we're going to learn this from exposure to parents or peers, our culture and environment. So this isn't something that occurs naturally. This is something that learn that we learn from watching others interact with that group or talk about that group or um, any of those things. And so we are shaped pretty dramatically by the environment that we're raised in and the interactions that we observe as we grow and change. And we also tend to see that these societal attitudes will change over time. Um, so it was, uh, sorry, <clears throat> an example of this would be the shift in, say, attitudes towards racism. Not to say that racism has been completely conquered or anything even remotely close to that, but in over time, we've started to see more changes towards um, attitudes towards prejudice like racism. So it used to not be illegal. It used to be something that was broadly encouraged, but over time, laws have been introduced and this societal perspective has started to shift where racism and other kinds of isms are strongly discouraged. Um, and so we're going to start seeing that some of these things change over time. But if we're going to continue on, after talking about prejudice, we can then talk about discrimination. So if prejudice are negative attitudes, discrimination is then negative or adversive behaviors that are directed at a particular group. So this would be people directing um, sort of negative behaviors at a group that they have negative and prejudiced behaviors or uh, beliefs about. So prejudice is the negative attitude. Discrimination is when they take action or behave in a way that's consistent with that negative attitude. So discrimination is when they start acting on those negative thoughts, those negative ideals. Um, and this is when it can start being extra harmful. Now, there are tons of theories regarding how we develop discriminatory behaviors, where discrimination comes from, why certain groups are selected for targets of prejudice and others are not. Um, we're just going to focus on a couple of these. There are entire classes that you can take um, on these kind of ideas if this is something that's of interest to you. Um, but we're going to focus in on the idea of a scapegoat. And this helps us explain why certain groups are targeted. So typically, a scapegoat is chosen because it is a group that is less powerful than your own group. So individuals in a particular in-group would choose to target those in an out-group that has less power than their own. And the reason that they do this is to help themselves feel more powerful because they're channeling their anger at another group that has less power than them. They get to feel more powerful. Um, and we even see a lot of situations where minorities, individuals who might be the target of discrimination themselves, might target other minorities um, because it helps them feel less discriminated against or less loss of power because they have power over something. Our next theory is the realistic conflict theory. So this is a different explanation for hatred. And this is based on the idea that there are few desirable jobs available. So the competition for limited resources ends up creating conflict. So um, if you are in a group that um, maybe doesn't have much and so there's another group that also doesn't have much, and so you're competing for the same resources. So you might frame the other group in a bad light because they're the reason why you don't have the resources that you have. Um, and neither of these is necessarily a correct way to frame ideas. It's just two potential ways that uh, discrimination might arise between different groups. And then our last slide for this section is to talk about interpersonal attraction. So this is just a very brief overview of why people tend to like other people. So what attracts someone to someone else? So if we wanted to look at some factors that increase liking or how much we are attracted to someone, um, their physical attractiveness is a massive factor. In a lot of cases, physical attractiveness is the defining and driving factor that determines whether, say, individuals who have gone on a first date decide to have a second date. Attractiveness is going to be one of those biggest factors that always comes up. Another factor is proximity. People tend to like the people that they see and interact with often. So if you're around someone a lot, you tend to like them more. 
And we also tend to like people who are similar. So it's interesting. We usually hear that sort of uh, adage that opposites attract, but even though someone who is the opposite of you might originally grab your attention, for that attraction to last, you should have some similarities or some complementary features, some things that go together. Um, we can also talk about the idea that mere exposure ends up being beneficial. So again, we have the adage of fil familiarity breeds contempt, where the more time you spend with someone, the more you hate them. But we find the exact opposite of that. The mere exposure effect says that the more you spend time with someone, the more experience you have with someone, you're going to enjoy them, their you're going to enjoy their time or spending time with them, and you're going to like them more. So familiarity actually breeds content where you like them instead of hate them. But despite all of these different factors, as I said, uh, physical appearance is one of our biggest driving factors of interpersonal attraction.